Hello there. This is Mark Mix from the Norman Zimbel Studio here at the National Right to Work Headquarters. It's a great privilege to have Steve Moore uh, with us today to kind of talk about lots of things, including right to work. I know that you, most of you turned into, tuned in to see Steve. He's, uh, it's hard to go a week or a night without seeing Steve on a major news channel talking about the economy. And, and certainly he has uh, uh, lots of experience in Washington, D.C. And, and talking about economics. It's a real privilege for me. I've, and Steve and I have known each other for, gosh, probably... Well, at least two years, right? We're not neither of us are that two old. Two zero but, years. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but it's been it's been a long time, and yeah. and Steve's been a great advocate for right to work over the years. Um, he came to Washington D.C. in 1983 and uh, spent some time with the Heritage Foundation uh, there, and then he ended up being on President Reagan's Privatization Commission. He was the research director for President Reagan and their administration, talking about privatization of certain government activities. He was at the Cato Institute for 10 years. He uh, he was at the Wall Street Journal as an editorial board writer there for several years. That was my favorite job. Yeah, <laughs> that was a lot of fun. Yeah, and that was good. I, I remember one day, I think it was 2007. I was at the airport waiting. Uh, waiting uh, to go through and pick up my bag at the airport. I get a call, and it's Steve Moore from Washington. He calls, Mark, what's going on in, in Iowa with the right to work law? I said, well, I'm out here to testify. And the next morning, to show the power of the National Right to Work Committee, there was an unsigned editorial about the economic damage that would be done if Iowa yeah. repealed their and right to work And I won't say law. who wrote that editorial. Yeah, that's right. That was, <laughs> that was Steve. And, and not only has he been an advocate from, from his perch at the Wall Street Journal, but as uh, an economist, he and Art Laffer have put out a study year after year at the Heritage Foundation and ALEC calling, called Rich State, Poor State, where they analyze the economies of states, and right to work is a pretty important aspect of that. Yeah. Um, he worked for Dick Armey at the Joint Commission uh, uh, in the U.S. Congress. He's uh, been a, an analyst in the Fox News Network. He's been an analyst on the CNN News Network, um, mm. which was kind of interesting. I'm sure that was a great experience for him. He's running a little operation now called the Committee to Unleash Prosperity while he's still serving at the Heritage Foundation as a senior fellow there. Um, Steve has been around uh, the administration and been around Congress for a lot of years. And, and right now, President Trump trusts him to be one of his key advisors on how we're going to reopen this economy. Uh, Steve has been a, a strong advocate for President Trump. He was on the campaign helping out in 2016. He wrote a book called uh, Trumponomics in 2018. Um, he's a well-established uh, author and just an all-around good guy. And we like him because he's a friend of, of right to work and the idea of individual freedom. Not only does he promote free markets in our economy and wants an economy that operates uh, with the greatest amount of freedom as possible, but he understands the element of individual freedom in America's workplaces um, and how that fits into the overall economic structure of our country and how it will lead to unleashing prosperity. So, Steve, I'm going to ask you to kind of go through what's happening in the economy. Um, if you can tell us some details about what the president's thinking, um, what you and Art Laffer and a few other economists who are sitting down with his staff and him to talk about how we move forward forward from where we are. If you could do that, sure. uh, we'd like to do that. We're going to have time for questions for folks. Um, what we'd like to do is have Steve address these issues, and that'll help stimulate some questions. And then, obviously, I'm going to have to talk about right to work a little bit, too. So, Good. Steve, why don't you tell us about what you think is going on and what you think the president's up to and what you're advising him. Well, thank you, Mark. And yeah. I'm such an admirer of uh, what you do and what all of the people here do at Right to Work. It's an uh, indispensable organization. So thank I appreciate you. it. I see this guy sometime 11 o'clock at night at airports. We're crossing paths and you're coming back from this city or that. You're amazing. So uh, I'll start by saying, you know, a good friend of mine named Tom Smith. Some of your members may, may know Tom. He was a self-made man. Uh, grew up very dirt poor and, and built a business that was highly successful and is a major donor to the free market conservative mm -hmm. movement. I'm on his board, the Thomas A. Smith uh, Foundation board, and he, he gives to all the right clauses. But he's 91 years old. Mm -hmm. And about uh, th four weeks ago, he called me and, you know, he's also been a happy warrior. You know, he's always upbeat, but I'd never seen him so sullen. And he said, Steve, he said, you know, I lived through the Great Depression. He said, I lived through World War II. I lived through the Vietnam War. I lived through 9-11. I've lived through the Great Recession. He said, I've never been more worried about our country than I am now. Mm -hmm. And I said, you, oh, you know, Tommy, that worried about the coronavirus. He said, no, not the coronavirus. What our government is doing in terms of these incredible powers, we've never seen anything like this in our lifetime. Uh, the, the suppression of freedom and individual rights uh, in the name of combating uh, this germ. And, you know, when he said that, I just, I thought, you know, he's right. He is right. And so I'm actually on leave from Heritage. I'm, I'm heading up this effort where we're trying to, I'm working with the president and a number of other 
you know, free market groups uh, to try to uh, make sure that we, number one, open up the economy as quickly and safely as possible. Number two, we stop this insane spending that mm. is going on, which is, we, I, you know, here's one that will knock off your socks, Mark. I, I have a piece that will probably be in the journal in the next few days that shows that if we were to pass this latest Pelosi spending bill, this $3 trillion bill, government spending as a share of GDP would go to 52%. That means our entire government sector would be larger than every business, every uh, all the output of every American worker. There's something seriously wrong with our Indeed. country when that happens. So we're trying to fight back against that. I know, you know, right to work is a major part of that freedom movement, um, and so. Uh, I think what's the, the current situation right now is I'm feeling if you talked to me two or three weeks ago, I was in a bad mood. I was really in a bad <laughs> mood. But I do think things are going better now. Yeah. I feel better about things. But you know why? Because we've got these red states that are opened up. You've got Georgia. You've got Florida. You've got Tennessee, Texas, Iowa. Uh, you've got Nebraska's open. Idaho's open. Utah. By the way, these are probably all right to work. States. They are. You think the about top it. 10 states you cited today in your in your your email yeah. on Committee for, to Unleash Prosperity yeah. were all right-to-work states. Yeah. yeah. And so those states, are not, folks, are not only opening up their economy, getting commerce flowing, and it's going to be slow. People are afraid. The media has really played a big role here in scaring the bejesus out of people. People are afraid. I've owned, I have family members who are normally rational people. They won't even go out outside of their house. They're mm -hmm. so afraid. Uh, we know a lot more about this virus. We can get into that later. But in any case, so you've got the red states open. And then think about the states that are closed. I mean, think about this, Mark. I mean, when I was driving over here, I was thinking about this. Okay, New York, Connecticut, New Jersey, Illinois, California, Washington, Oregon. Uh, is Michigan right to work? It is a right to work. Uh, right. Yeah. That's the only yeah. one that doesn't fit the pattern. <laughs> That's right. But That's all right. the other ones are, you know, shut down. They're, they're empowering. These Democratic governors are impoverishing their own citizens. Yeah. And they are destroying their small business uh, framework and, and, and their, their, uh, the infrastructure, the economic infrastructure of their, uh, of their states. I was in Chicago on Monday, Memorial Day, for a big rally to open up the economy because Pritzker is one of the worst. Is he, yeah. right, is he a right-to-work guy? No, no, absolutely <laughs> I not. I wouldn't think yeah. he would be. Yeah. I mean, he's just a tool of the, of the, of the teachers' unions. Yeah. But in any case, you know, we had uh, over 2,000 people out. Uh, you know, peacefully protesting. That's a constitutional right. You know, right. The left wants to take that right away from us, too. But I, I, the reason I mention that, and this is so important for your, uh, for your members to understand, some may be in Chicago. You have, I'm sure you have members yep. in the Chicago area. Mm -hmm. I was, I grew up, I'm a Chicago boy. I grew up, I think Chicago is one of the great world-class cities in the world. I love Chicago. And it is the capital of the Midwest. And uh, walking down Michigan Avenue, walking down State Street, it was like ghost town. Hmm. Ghost town. It was so sad, Mark. All these small businesses, you know, little immigrant businesses, delis, stores, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, grocery stores, things like everything was shut down. And you can't do that. You can't do that to an economy and think that somehow you can just switch the switch the ignition switch and it's going to be back on. It's going to be a tough summer. We've done severe damage, and I'm writing a column right now, and then I'll stop talking. Uh, called "Never, Never Again." Hmm. Never should we do this, where we shut down. A society cannot function if people aren't producing things, right? I mean, it's that simple. You can't function as a society without people going to work and businesses producing things. I mean, you're just going to run out of things. We'll be like the Soviet Union. Everything will be, you'll have all this free money. We're printing all this money. But at some point, you run out of food. You run out of merchandise. You run out of things because nobody's producing things. And so, uh, I, but I do feel the red states are putting the pressure on the blue states to open. I think in the next couple of weeks, we're going to see states like Illinois and New York and, and, uh, and even California open up. And that will be a very positive thing. Yeah, Steve, if you could look down three months, four months, five months down the road, and, and, you know, the president's obviously under pressure. There's no way he can win because if he does too little, he's to blame. Right. If he does too much, he's to blame. Yep. There's really no way to thread the needle. And, and I think, you know, governors like Newsom and Cuomo understand the politics of all this. And, and, and I think, you know, thinking about an economy restarting without California and New York, even though people are migrating out of those states uh, in droves, they're still engines of an economy, and yeah. and I think they realize the political nature of, of how to continue to shut this down to pressure the president. You know, how is the president feeling about this? I mean, he, is he he seems to be an optimistic guy, and he seems to be lots of energy still, but I mean, when you sit down in the room with him and he's and he's getting blamed from all sides, what? positive things can you tell them or what positive things can we look for to think that maybe three or four months from now there's actually some green shoots uh, to use a word from gosh when was that 2008 or 2009 I don't know um, so um, 
I have not seen the president probably in three months now because oh, wow. he's been a lockdown. You know, so oh, yeah. we've all of our meetings. I'm on, you mentioned I'm on his uh, economic recovery task force. All of them have been via phone calls, mm -hmm. uh, and so and that's appropriate. You know, the president can't be coming in contact with people. We don't. Sure. The last thing we want is as President Trump to get coronavirus. But he's, by the way, one of them. Just as an aside. He, that guy's a freak of nature. I mean, he you, you think you work a lot, Mark, and I know you do. <laughs> that guy goes 20 hours a day, practically. Wow. I mean, he, he, he'd call me up at 2 in the morning like, hey, Steve, what are you doing? Uh, Sir, I'm sleeping, like most people are. <laughs> but he's, he's amazing. So, he, and he's, he's always been so incredibly healthy and, and uh, so on. And um, so I can't say how he is in his demeanor now because I haven't seen him in a while. But I know from just talking to him on the phone a few times, he's frustrated. I'd say frustrated is the mm. word. Because Mark... And I'm really proud. We, you know, I work with Larry Kudlow and Art Laffer, and, and I were kind of the economics team when he was running for president. We put this plan together. It would come, you know, late 2019. We get that trade deal done with China. Yeah. We get the U.S. Canada Mexico trade agreement done. You know, we at the starting of 2020, the economy was booming. I mean, boom! One of the strongest economy. I mean, I, I know a lot of your. Uh, of your members, our owners of businesses, and you know, tell me if business wasn't good at the beginning of 2020, because almost every, you know, the business yeah. confidence index was just soaring because of the great things that were happening. And so I think what's frustrated him is that, you know, in two months' time, think about this, Mark, we went from an economy that's six million surplus jobs, that's six million more people with, uh, you know, more jobs opening than people to fill them, now we have 35 million people unemployed. Yeah. And I think what we've done in our country in the last three months has been um, horrific. And uh, we've learned a lot of lessons here, but one is we, we cannot, sh you can't shut down a $20 trillion economy of free market businesses and entrepreneurs and expect it to just fire back up again. Yeah. Yeah, and so well, it's interesting, Steve, you mentioned that. This is, I, I'm going to jump in with a question from Victor in California. He says, based on what the President Trump <laughs> knows now, do you think it was a mistake to shut down the economy? Thanks for the question, Victor. I, that one was question. so apropos to what yeah. Steve was talking <laughs> it's about. It's perfect. Yeah. Uh, you, you be know, careful now. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah. Look, I, I, first of all, I don't think the President had any choice, really. Right. And uh, I would make a couple of ways. This is a really important question. Number one, President Trump did not shut down the economy. This mm. is important for yes. people to understand. Yes. He declared a national emergency, which was appropriate. I mean, uh, we didn't know a lot about coronavirus at the time. And, you know, people, I remember it was just pandemonium. Remember, was, people were, you know. So he basically said, appropriately, the states will take the lead. And what, ha you know, a lot of people don't know. That there were eight states that never shut down anything. Yeah. You know, so, and, and then uh, you had, a, a, you know, various degrees of shutdown. Uh, I'm not going to speak for the president, but I'm going to say this. I, I am absolutely convinced, and I think more and more free market conservatives, uh, I was one of the first people to say it, this is insanity, what yeah. we're doing. But I think now almost all you know, Republicans and conservatives and free market people understand we made major mistakes here. We didn't, the reason I think the president is so frustrated is let's take Cuomo, for example. You mentioned him. You, did you see his press conference on uh, Monday? He said, yeah. he said, we don't know what we're doing here. All the science that we've, you know, seriously, I mean, yeah. people should look at this. Go to YouTube. He said, we don't know what we're doing. All the science and all the experts were wrong. He said, you know, I don't know how long we're going to keep New York uh, closed down. And he admitted that every, all the experts and, and the science uh, and all the studies were wrong. And they were wrong. Remember the two million deaths yeah. figure? That was, not only was that uh, bad science, that wasn't even science. That was just made up. And that, remember that headline is what led to the shutdown. People, even I was like, two million people are going to die. It wasn't even, it was not even close to the truth. So one of the lessons here is sometimes this, all this, you know, the left is, listen to the science, listen to the science. Well, many, many times the science is, is false, just like the media can be false. And so I think the president, I'm not going to answer that question about whether he thinks there was a mistake, but I will say this. There is nobody in Washington, D.C., including you and me, there is nobody who wants to open up this economy more than Donald J. Trump does. Right. <laughs> I, I think that's right, Steve. And, and again, so let's let's talk about we want to get things open. States are starting to reopen. Yeah. Um, what is what does that look like six months down the road for the economy? I mean, obviously, you've talked about the the trillions. I mean, we had phase one, which was what, eight point three billion, then ninety seven billion, <laughs> then two trillion. Those were only the billions. Yeah, and then we got then, into then the we had two trillions yeah, right. and we had another four hundred billion <laughs> yeah. as and phase now three. three trillion. And now three trillion. Yeah. I mean, and now we're we're there's still talk of more. Right. So uh, the, here's what I uh, think will happen. I, I do not believe we're going to have the V-shaped recovery. I, Donald Trump has talked a lot about that, where we okay. just, you know, we went way, way down and then we go way, way up. I hope I'm wrong, but I'd love to see a V-shaped recovery. But I just think we've done so much damage. These businesses, 
Again, you know, the other thing I love about your, your organization, you represent these small, medium-sized businesses that are the spinal cord of our economy. You can't just shut it off and shut it on. That's the problem with these politicians. None of them ever run a business. Yeah. They don't know anything. Do you think Nancy Pelosi knows anything about business? I mean, seriously, she knows nothing. So I do think it's going to be hard for these businesses to get up and running. And, and it's going to take some time uh, for, for restaurants and bars to get people to go back in. They've been scared to death. Uh, so I think the summer is going to be really bad. I think we're going to have 20% unemployment, maybe 25. That's wow. that's really bad. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, this is an, not an act of nature, folks. This was an act of man <laughs> that we may, we impose this on ourselves. Uh, but I do think because we have Trump, you know, cutting taxes, reducing regulations, he passed that big regulatory yep. relief bill last week. I think the fall we're going to start to see a recovery, and then they're going to have an election. And that election, I believe, is going to be an enormously important one. And I believe it's going to come down to one question for the American people. Who do you believe, Joe Biden or Donald Trump, can, can uh, restore growth and prosperity to America? And God, I pray the American people get that one right. Get that one it right. It's not yeah. hard, right? Yeah, yeah, indeed. It, it is. Um, let, let's talk about the, the, the $3 trillion that Nancy Pelosi got through the House of Representatives included basically a trillion dollars straight out to the states. And one of the things we've been talking about, Steve, and this is something to kind of address it tangentially, is the idea of these pensions. I mean, this money is going to states that have not, this is not coronavirus emergency money. This is paper over years of mismanagement that includes making promises to union officials who have monopoly power over government employees in many of these states, California, New York, Illinois. I mean, I, I don't think you'd argue with me if you take the biggest political power in Illinois politics is the Chicago Teachers Union. They get whatever they want. Yeah, yeah. And then you and it asks me in the SEIU, yeah. the two government unions, and you've got a yeah. you've got a power structure yeah. there that basically controls Springfield and That's Chicago. Right. So these pensions, I mean, the, these are we had the, the the one legislator from New Jersey saying we're going to be on our knees begging the federal government for 130 billion dollars of bailout money. We had the Senate Majority Leader, Don Harmon, in, in Illinois saying, we want $41.9 billion right now. We want $15 billion unattached, no strings. We want it. And what they're asking for is really to solve problems that have been years in the making, given making promises to workers and making promises to, to and services in government that could never been fulfilled. They were all John, they were all Keynesians, you know, in the long run, we're all dead. So let's just give everybody everything. Yes. I mean, talk about the pension system and what that means. I mean, we, we have a question from Brett in Maryland. You know, what are the chances of any kind of taxpayer funded bailout of the already bankrupt multi-employer pension plans? That goes to, you know, like the Teamster yeah. central states plan where, you know, employers put in money and then when groups when companies disappear because they go bankrupt, others have to pick up the change. Yeah, and yes, yes, yes. can you address some of that issue? Well, uh, there's two. Those are two separate issues. Yeah. Actually, because so the, there's the pensions of the government employees that you, right. you started talking about. And uh, you know, as long as I've known you, we've been talking about this issue. I mean, it's not like, gee, Illinois has a hundred billion dollar deficit in their pensions. They've known that for 20 years. They just refuse to do anything about it. Uh, same thing with California and, and uh, so many of these other states that have massive, massive. Uh, pension deficits. Uh, I, I am, uh, when I mentioned the fact that I'm leading this coalition group, one of our single biggest initiatives is to stop any blue state bailout. Yeah. We cannot, it is, first of all, it's terrible, it's unconstitutional. The federal government, uh, all you're doing is redistribute, you know, this idea that somehow the federal government can bail out the states. No, the federal government can only get money if it takes it from the states in the first place. Yeah. I think. Mean, the, the, the logic of this, that somehow, oh, we're going to help all the states. No, the federal government doesn't produce anything, folks. It's a swap. All it does is take money from you, and then it sends 90 cents back on every dollar you give. So first of all, it's just fallacious. All you're doing is redistributing. So where are you re redistributing to and from? Well, in this case, it's obvious. Red states are being raped and pillaged so they can uh, you know, have, uh, have uh, pensions paid for. And, and I'm going to go beyond that, by the way. It's not just the pensions, although that's a big part of it. Yeah. Here's one of the reasons I'm so adamantly opposed to the federal government giving any more money to the states. By the way, we've already given them $150 billion. Did okay. you know that? I did They've not know already that. given them $150 billion. Mm -hmm. And it's because of this. this is, we become enablers of states mm -hmm. to stay shut down. The only way Michigan can stay shut down and Pennsylvania is going to stay shut down and New York and Illinois can be shut down is because they really believe there's a pot of gold at the end of this rainbow and all of a sudden the federal government's going to write them a check. And we have to say, Trump should say, no, it's not coming. You, you know, you're going to have to start doing something about your budgets, adjusting your budgets. You're going to have to do something about your pension plans. We're not writing you a big check. And if, if Cuomo knew that, if Newsom knew that, if Pritzker knew that, 
they would have no other choice but to open up their economy. Yeah. But and, and by the way, how is it fair? The left loves to talk about fairness, fair, fair, fair. How is it fair for people in Tennessee and Texas and Georgia that built up rainy day funds, that acted fiscally responsible for the last 20 years, that have opened up their economies? Now they have to pay additional taxes to bail out Illinois and New York and California. No, no, I mean, not just no, hell no to that. Okay. Now, on the pensions, multi-employer pensions, mm -hmm. I'm not an expert on that. I know there's a lot of lobbying going on. I get calls every day, you know, hey, where do you stand on this issue? And th these are also these pensions that, um, and the, I believe these are union pensions. Yeah, they, right. they are, right. quote, co-employer union right. pensions. The, the unions negotiate them, and they take them in, and then they manage the money in a large way, and there's trustees, of course. Right. But some of this money ends up in casinos. Some of this right, money right, ends yeah, up exactly. in disappearing. So and, the, the, yeah. what's going on is that you've got some of these big companies like UPS that are really lobbying for a bailout of those pensions. Uh, and then you've got some Republicans say, well, let's bail it out because, you know, we, it's, a lot of these workers are in Pennsylvania, Michigan. we got to win these states. So yeah, the there's all sorts of different things going on. Uh, I, d I don't know whether that's going to happen or not. I'm, I'm opposed to it, though. I don't think the federal government should have to be a bailout private pension plans. But Steve, how much how much more bailouts can we do? I mean, you <laughs> exactly. you talked about this yeah. I, on the money right. show a couple right. weeks ago. You right. talked about this when and somebody asked you the question about it. You know, how much can they do? I mean, at what price? What is the price of government? Well, I mean, first of all, I was Milton Friedman. You knew Milton. I knew yeah. Milton. I know most of your members are, are advocates of Milton Friedman. And, you know, he taught us the most important lesson of economics, which is there's no such thing as a free lunch. Yeah. I mean, if you're giving somebody something, you have to take it away from somebody else. I mean, Laffer talks a lot about this. You, if you and I are two people on an island, and you're going to get some benefit. The only person who can pay for that benefit is me, right? <laughs> so, the, the, again, there's this illusion of free money out there right now. And I think part of that, by the way, Mark, is being driven by the fact that look at the interest rate on the 30-year bond right now. Yeah, right, it's 1.3%. Right. I mean, by the way, I'm not an investment advisor, folks, but if you buy one of those 30-year bonds at 1.3% interest rate, you're crazy. Because, <laughs> you know, is there anybody yeah. who actually thinks over the next 30 years inflation is going to be less than 1.3%? I mean, it, you know, I, I would uh, say, say that the, the chances of that are very remote. Um, but, you know, that has enabled some of this borrowing because yeah. you, what's going on is everybody wants to own dollars now because, uh, because uh, whenever you have a financial crisis, everybody rushes to the dollar. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I want to transition a little bit into some of the union monopoly power that's caused some of this. We talked about papering over some of the uh, huge deficits been created, but we have a, a Democrat governor of Minnesota, Tim Waltz, that basically by executive order said we're going to we're going to withdraw union bargaining privileges over 50,000 state employees. We've had the South Dakota legislature that's repealed union bargaining for their higher education employees. We've had uh, the city of uh, Las Vegas say, you know what, we're going to put our union agreement on hold so that we can actually control our government. One That's of the things really. that so we they're see, just, they're yeah, just, they're just saying, they're saying you know, we're going to stop it. Of course, the unions are suing them yeah, and right. lawsuits That's are That's a really hitting. interesting development yeah. because I don't see any other way out of it for a lot of these states. Right, right. right. I mean, the, that's why all these unions are coming to Washington and saying, hey, bail out the states because that money is going to go right into Directly, the union right, coffers. Right, to pay it over. Yeah, so, and we've been, we've been obviously strong advocates for eliminating that union budget. There, 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 there must be, I mean, I, I'm not a, cons a, a legal scholar, but I wonder if, you know, states actually have the authority to break these contracts to do that. I mean, uh, well, well, I think see. they'll do it yeah. and they'll litigate it. And yeah. then some judge will either allow them to continue to process while the legal yeah. cases go on. In Las Vegas, we know the union has filed a lawsuit against the city. But the it county certainly would be there. appropriate to me, you know, yeah. to, to, I mean, if I were governor, I'd just say, look, here's our, here's our mail. Here's, here's yeah. the money coming in. Here's the money going out. Yeah. We got a big deficit. There's no way. And, and just say, look, you're going to have to renegotiate this contract. You're going to have to, uh, uh, you're going to have to, uh, we don't have the money to pay it. And if you force us to pay it, then we're going to have to slash services and then and, and, and we can't give you a good contract later. So there has to be a way where the unions provide some uh, some give on this or else they're going to have to slash, slash their workforces and things like that. So, yeah. uh, Because my, my, by my estimates, state and local uh, receipts are going to be down at least 30%. This oh, year. my goodness. At least 30%. Because the thing about it, sales taxes, income tax, I mean, incomes down, sales is down. I mean, so um, I, I do think that the unions are going to have to come to some agreements with these states. Well, speaking of that, here's a relevant question to that, Steve. Richard in Illinois says early Sunday morning, the legislature in Illinois passed a new budget with no cuts. Yeah. The governor said, oh, we can't get it from the federal government because of COVID or with federal law, or we can get it from the federal government. How can irresponsibility like this be stopped? I mean... Yeah, in fact, I was just reading the Wall Street Journal about Illinois, Richard, that they uh, that they actually gave um, uh, like raises to workers. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Uh, so they, they're living in la la land. 
They yeah. really are. And that's why I want Trump to just make an announcement. I, first of all, I think Donald Trump should have a State of the Union speech in the next week ah, or two. The whole that's country, a good idea. And just mm -hmm. say, here's the situation. He could say, look, we've made some mistakes. We're learning about this as we go. We think we've reached a turning point. But if you live in Pennsylvania, Michigan, you know, Illinois, New York, put pressure on your governors and mayors to get things open. Uh, but then he should say loud and clear, we are not bailing irresponsible states out. It is not fair to the states that acted responsibly. And if he did that, I think it would, it would, uh, it would stop some of these states from, uh, from passing these very irresponsible budgets. Yeah. I think you addressed that earlier in saying, you know, they they're literally are thinking that yes, this pot of enabling. gold at the end of the yeah. rainbow and, and we've enabled them. It's like but giving a drunk another <clears throat> drink. Yeah, right. I, I mean, yeah. does that solve anybody's problems? Yeah. No. Let's talk about from an employment perspective. I heard you on the, the Money Show show that you did a week yeah. ago. You talked about 31 states that are literally paying employees more to stay home than they would to work. Talk about that for a minute. It's just a disgrace. You know, that per first bill, anytime, to quote my friend Larry Lapper, anytime Congress acts when they're drunk or when they're in a crisis, they made bad, bad decisions. <laughs> and they made that first bill was really a bad bill. Yeah. And it passed unanimously in the House and Senate. So that should have been a tip off that <laughs> it was a bad bill. Yeah. And so what they did was they made two big mistakes. Number one, we, wh I was in favor and Laffer was in favor of a loan program for small businesses when the government was closing down, I mean the economy was closing down, to give these businesses uh, that were healthy before the crisis hit a bridge loan so they could get through the next six months so that they could be up and running when the economy re re recovered. A loan, L-O-A-N, that means you pay it back. And what they did, because of Pelosi and some people in the White House, and I won't mention names, uh, they basically said, no, let's make this a forgivable loan, where if you don't lay off people, you, you, uh, will, uh, you, you don't have to pay it back. So guess what happened? I mean, this is so predictable, right? Every healthy business signed up for the loans, right? Because they weren't going to you know, lay off people anyways. Ah. And so they, and it was always the way Washington works, is you know, all the people with lobbyists and stuff, they knew how to get first in line for the loans. So the small business uh, Main Street, USA, they couldn't get the loans. And so that was number one. And we should, every, if, by the way, if, if, and I'm against any aid to the states, if we give them any aid, it should be in the form of a loan, not a grant. Uh, so the second mistake we made is not only did we provide them a hundred, these workers, a hundred percent unemployment benefit, meaning they get their entire salary, right. but we also gave them $600 a month addition to that. Uh, so they were, in 31 states, people were getting paid more when they became unemployed, unemployed. And I have a friend who runs a construction company. I bet, I bet a lot of the people watching this can relate to this. He had 100 employees. He was still going strong. The day after they passed that bill, 40 of them just walked off the job. Oh, my goodness. 40 of them just said, I'm not. Why? And, and you know, why, the, the ones who stayed on the jobs who were honorable people, they were the suckers, right? They, they have to still get up at 6 in the morning. They still have to, you know, construction's hard work, right? And, and they, they work hard, and yet the guy who's watching TV gets more. Yeah. What's wrong with that picture? So, and we still haven't fixed that. Yeah. Pelosi wants to extend that policy, folks. I'm not making this up. Pelosi wants to extend that policy through the end of the year. Gee, why do you think she might want to do that? Yeah. You know, to extend the unemployment, you know, for months and months and months. Uh, maybe it's because there's an election in November. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it just seems irresponsible. And I think that it, we're kind of disincentivizing ways to recover from this by... Oh, yeah, because businesses, I bet, again, a lot, a lot of your... Uh, members can relate to this. It's going to be hard to get people back on the job now. Yeah. We do have businesses that are hiring now. And you know, here we are. Think about this, Mark. We have 38 million people unemployed and businesses can't get people on the job. Yeah. And what's wrong with that picture? Yeah, it is interesting. <laughs> let's, let's switch gears just a little bit here and talk about, uh, and, and obviously want to talk a little bit about right to work. I want to talk about your rich state, poor state uh, uh -huh. analysis that you've done yeah. every year for the last probably 10 or 15 years. You've talked about 12, the act 12 years. 12 years. Okay. Um, this is the first year we're not going to do it because of the, we're a victim of the coronavirus. Yeah, so right, right, we'll right. Yeah, but you and Arthur Laffer put this together and yes. someone else is now involved yep. in it and you put this out. And basically you look at the economies of every state and you look at various yes. tax policy. About 20 variables. Yeah, yep. regula regulatory policy. And one of the things you include is right to work. And mm -hmm. I think every, every time, and this has been demonstrable, uh, prior to the COVID-19, the right to work states have outperformed. Oh, yeah. and, and not only on, in your study, but just literally yeah. in private sector yeah. job creation, in Everything. manufacturing job growth, and the real kind of value added manufacturing and jobs that create wealth, that create opportunities for workers. And you know the union officials, rely, they, they argue about right to work all the time. And obviously they have self-interest because it's a pretty neat deal if you can force someone to pay you in order to work. Um, that's an outrage. But talk a little bit about that, about how you see um, these 
you know, kind of the business environments beginning to separate themselves. I, we see that uh, from a right to work perspective. The right to work states, you know, the tire industry has gone to South Carolina. The automotive industry has gone below the Mason Dixon yeah. line. Uh, steel manufacturing, new kind of in industry and heavy industry is going to right to work states. And, you know, we had the, the roll, the aluminum rolling mill in Kentucky where uh, a guy said he was in Illinois and he said, look, you pass a right to work law, I'll bring $1.8 billion in investment to your state. He did it. Wow. And now there's new jobs diversifying yeah. the economy there. Talk a little bit about that. Well, first of all, congratulations to you, because I think when we first met, there were like 22 right-to-work states. And now, how, Something we, like that. Yeah, there were, there were actually probably 21. Okay. Yeah, so and how now many are 27. We now? Yeah, 27. so that's amazing. You, you've done amazing work, and so congratulations. Yeah. And in some of the toughest states, too, right? Yeah, they're like they're pretty tough, yeah. Indiana, yeah. Michigan, Wisconsin. Yeah, yeah. amazing. Yeah. So, uh, and that's because the governors were looking at the evidence. Yeah. You know, they were saying, look, we can't, uh, we can't, uh, you know, attract businesses if we don't become right to work. When I was at the Wall Street Journal, you know, we were visited all the time. Uh, every week we'd have uh, editorial board meetings with, you know, CEOs of major companies, you know, that are major employers. And what they'd say, you know, when we look at where we're going to put, put a new factory or a new warehouse or a new uh, uh, business center, they say, if it's not to right to work state, we don't even consider it. Yeah. So they're not even in the game, yeah. right? So now they're looking at just, and so it's really important to businesses that they be right to work. And we say that that's the second, and you and I might have a little argument about this. We think it's the second most important factor. We would argue that, yeah, we would definitely argue factor. about that. Yeah. Uh, the yeah. first important factor is how high the taxes are. Sure. But, it, you know, they're close though. I mean, and those two things, you look at the states with high taxes, and that are forced union states, and those states are just bleeding jobs, yeah. bleeding jobs. And what's so interesting is these blue states, it circles back to our discussion about what's happening in the blue states now where they're not opening. I believe that bleeding of blue states is going to accelerate now. And these states like New York and Illinois and, you know, and unfortunately Michigan and Pennsylvania, if they don't get new leadership, I think that you're, you're going to see a bleeding out of their, of their businesses. I talked to a guy in Wisconsin. He may have been a right to work uh, member and he has a factory with about a uh, hundred employees. He said, look, if Wisconsin is not going to open up in the next two weeks, oh boy. I'm going to Arizona. I mean, oh and he, he, you know, he built his business in Wisconsin. He said, but look, if they're not going to let me operate, I have to operate. This is the other thing politicians don't understand. Without revenues, a business doesn't exist. What? Let's <laughs> yeah, explain right. Explain that to revenues. me. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, he said, I can't, I can't, I can't keep this locked up. There will be no business left uh, to reopen. Yeah. Well, we're getting ready, gearing up to a political season that is going to be unlike any we've ever seen. Steve, you know, you and I talk. We we meet with a lot of folks. I've been I've been a warm up band for Steve Moore many times on stages. He's the he's the featured guest. I, I warm the, the crowd up a little bit. And uh, but you know, we talk about politics and we talk about elections and we talk about this election. We have the White House, the House of Representatives, the U.S. Senate, and probably one or two seats on the United States Supreme Court, and then. The federal, other than federal that, judiciary. That other than that, it's not important. <laughs> Talk a little bit about that. I mean, you well, take so this emergency. I'm just going to have one other thing. You know, one of the things we've really learned in this emergency is how important governors are. Oh. You know, governors are incredibly important. They really, and some of these Democrats have acted like they're a dictator. You know, when you listen to what, uh, you know, Governor Cuomo was saying or what Governor Pritzker is saying or Governor uh, Evers in Wisconsin. And what a yeah. shame, by the way, that Scott Walker wasn't the governor of Wisconsin yeah. to get Wisconsin through this sure. because it would be in much, much better shape today uh, if, if he were still governor. Um, so, yeah, it is an incredibly important election. Um, I Look, I'm just going to say it. I think if, if we have a really weak economy in the fall and you elect uh, you know, Joe Biden as president, I think we would have a Great Depression. I think we'd have five years of very high unemployment with a lot of disinvestment in the United States, all of the great things that we were able to accomplish under Trump. I mean, what, they keep saying they want to repeal the Trump tax cut. Why? Why would they want to do that? Yeah. It's been a yeah. huge success. I mean, we had wages rising. We had six million surplus jobs. We had the most lowest unemployment rate 50 years. We had minority, uh, you know, uh, wages rising. We had low income people's ma wages rising. You know, you had uh, all of these stores like McDonald's and Burger King and Walmart, they were raising their wages because it was such a tight labor market. You know, you and I obviously want, want workers to be paid as well as they can. Absolutely. We just don't want the government to tell <laughs> to dictate that. It's the law of supply and demand. And so <coughs> I do worry about that, you know, what would happen because folks, I mean, it's important to understand 
Joe Biden would not be running the party. This would be uh, Pelosi and AOC and people like that. Did you see AOC, that crazy woman? She's on one of the economic task force of, of Joe Biden. Yeah, that yeah. tells you a lot about. Well, and five five union officials are on that task force as well. We put out a story about yeah. that the other day. Um, that he's. Gee, who do you think runs the Democratic yeah. Party when you see it's the radical Greens, it's the labor unions, it's the school teachers, uh, and and they're they're completely in charge. And yeah. if you think that this shutdown now, I, I, I forgot to make this point, but it's important. I've been saying for two months now. This is a trial run. This this shutdown of the economy for uh, coronavirus is a trial run for you know what climate change yeah so i mean the, the left is writing you gotta re you can't believe this this has been such a wonderful shutdown of the economy look at our carbon emissions are going down wow what a wonderful thing you know we put 40 million people on unemployment line but we're reducing our carbon so i mean think about this if they can shut down the economy for two months to save you know a few thousand lives what could they do to save the whole planet you know so uh so those are the kinds of things that are at stake here if you're in the oil and gas business or the coal business uh you know your your um businesses are in great jeopardy um if if we have uh, if we have Joe Biden as president. Let me circle back to an issue I forgot to mention, but I think it's important because in knowing you all these years, Steve, you have made econom uh, economics kind of simple. And I, it's important for me to be it's simple. It's not complicated. Because I, yeah, well. I mean, no, seriously. Yeah. Economics <laughs> is not complicated. The only people who don't understand economics are the PhDs. Yeah, at right, that are well, overeducated, yeah. yeah. Well, you, you know, we have employees. We have a print shop and a mail shop, yeah. and we have an operation in Virginia Beach, and we have a couple of employees that are using the COVID employee leave to take care of children who were basically rushed out of school, and now daycare has been shut down. And so, uh, but the formula for, you know, we're getting a payroll tax credit, um, but we have to, there's six different tests and six different iterations and two thirds of this and how to calculate hours going back six months. You have advocated for basically just a payroll tax holiday or setting it aside. Yes. That's simple. It yes. makes sense yes. as an employer. That makes perfect oh, sense yeah. to me. Talk a little bit about that. Well, this is, we're trying to, you know, Laffer and I and Steve Forbes, are trying to put, and by the way, the other guy who loves this idea is DJT. Donald Trump loves this yeah. idea too. And the idea is, look, stop giving all these aid, all these spending programs, and, and you know, they all have big administrative costs. Right. You know, you have to tax, collect the taxes, then Washington bureaucrats shuffle the money around, they get paid for that, then they send back to the states, and then, they, you know, probably get about 70 cents out of the dollar that actually goes to the people in need. This, boom, all of a sudden you just, you are starting, let's say, June 1st, your paycheck, my check, it may pay, my paycheck, everyone in this room's paycheck is reduced by, uh, I mean, they get a 7.5% pay rate. Right. Because the money is, isn't with, with, withheld from your tax. And yeah. then for an employer like you, you're, now your payroll costs will go down by 7.5%. Yeah. I would think that means that you helps. might be able to hire. You know, a, yeah. it helps you with, you know, everybody's facing financial problems in this yeah. tough economy. But it's, you know, hey, maybe we can bring on a couple more workers because our payroll costs are down. So this is a big deal. Trump wants to do it. Pelosi hates the idea because she wants well, the money. Victor, to go to Victor asked a question. He says, what are the odds that Pelosi and company oh, will payroll tax? Well, here's the point, Victor, is that what we need to do is we need to take it right to her and say, look, Nancy Pelosi, you say you care about minimum wage workers. You say you care about working class Americans. Why are you against giving a minimum wage worker a 7.5% pay raise? Why are you against uh, that construction worker who was working for 20 bucks an hour you know, now he gets $23 an hour, whatever it might be. Why are you against that? Because she, I think she has a hard time explaining that. And by the way, that issue is not just good policy. It's great politics. So we did some polling. Yeah. You ask people, what would you rather do? Have the federal government give money to the mayors and uh, uh, governors or have a payroll tax cut so you get more money in your paycheck? 68% give the money, you know, show me the money. Yeah. And, uh, you know, about 22% say give it to the mayors. And, and, uh, and those are probably the public employee people. But this is a great issue from a political and policy perspective. We need to get everybody behind it. And we need to force this. Is, see, this is the thing. I mean, Victor asked a good question about, well, what about Pelosi? I'm sick and tired of Donald Trump negotiating with Pelosi. Mm. There's nothing that Nancy Pelosi wants to do, folks. Nothing that she has proposed that's good for the economy, good for workers, good for businesses. Uh, everything in that bill that she proposes is radical left-wing stuff. And so what I want Trump to do is go over her head. Remember the way Reagan used to do yeah. with Tip O'Neill. You know, if they had a conflict, 
he would give a speech to the American <laughs> people, right? Yeah. And he'd say, yeah. call your congressman. And, and, you know, wouldn't it be great if Trump gave a speech and said, I want to give you a 7.5% pay raise. The only reason you can't get that 7.5% pay raise is because of Nancy Pelosi. Call your congressman, call your congresswoman, and tell them to give me a 7.5% pay raise and let me keep more of my own money. Yeah. I mean, that don't you think that would be yeah. a good strategy? We've got a phone bank going right now. Yeah. Our Virginia phone, yeah. We're calling the Colorado legislature trying to stop the imposition of a statutory bargaining bill for all government employees. Uh -huh. It's working. They announced today that they're going to put off anything that has a fiscal note for the remaining two weeks. Good yeah. Job. Good so, job. yeah, our phone bank is ready and oh, able. People, and people going, really, re I mean, members of Congress, because you guys do such a great job of that. I know how you can flood the Capitol with calls or flood uh, state capitals. But the people that I, I worked on Capitol Hill, I want to let your, uh, your uh, members know that that is what these uh, people uh, in Congress. Oh, but Steve, they say it doesn't, it doesn't oh, affect us. Oh, it has us. a huge impact. <laughs> it really does. The first thing yeah. the congressman or congresswoman does when they walk in the office, the first question they ask, what are you getting calls about? Yeah. Oh, yeah. we've gotten 52 calls today of people who are opposed to Bill, you know, 128 or whatever yeah. it is. What's that? Oh, that's the forced union bill. Yeah. Believe me, they listen to that stuff. And that's, that's the strength of the right to work movement. We're, we're at a time, Steve's got another event coming up about 4.30, and we, we're at a time when we want to take questions. If we haven't asked your question yet, go ahead and get them in now, and uh, we'll get them up on the screen, and, and I'll, let, I'll ask them, and then we'll, uh, we'll let Steve answer them, because we're running a little bit short. I want to be respectful of Steve's time. I'm not sure. Are you going to be on TV tonight anywhere, Steve? Are you going to be... Uh, 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 I'm supposed to be on Fox, but, you know, they've been... You know, they're supposed to have this, uh, as we speak, I think they're having this uh, launch of the... Uh, oh, the uh, rocket. Yeah, yeah the, so the everything's kind of messed SpaceX up on the schedule. SpaceX or whatever but. it is. Okay, John in California, while it would be counterproductive to attempt prior to November, have you any sense of Donald J. Trump's interest in the repeal of Davis-Bacon of 1933 during his second term? Now, Steve, remember this, this is the prevailing wage law where yeah, if you have know. state and government <laughs> money, Davis you know Bacon. about it. Yeah, yeah, and, sure, for example, when, when Pete Wilson had the earthquake out there, he, he suspended prevailing wage, and they got the job done under budget and on time. Um, we're in an emergency. One of the provisions of Nancy Pelosi's bill, the 6800, the 1850 page bill, was says that any subcontractor, any contractor doing work with federal money has to be paid prevailing wage, which is a 30 yeah. percent, up to a 30 percent increase in the cost of government services. Yeah. What do you think? Well, we've been, you know, and I've been fighting that fight for 30 years, and I, I do think it's time to bring Davis Bacon to uh, to just repeal it. It was a bill that was discriminatory in intent right. back when it passed, and it's discriminatory in its in its effect. Um, you know, it's just a tough, it's just a tough one. Um, Trump, uh, remember, you know, Trump. There, I believe there's a big difference right now between the private sector unions and the public sector unions. Yeah. Trump did pretty well with private sector union workers. Um, so we'll, we'll see about Davis Bacon. I would love to see it repealed because you could you could do so many. People talk about the infrastructure crisis. If you got rid of Davis Bacon, you could build more roads, you know, fix more dams, fix more airports. Uh, you know, I always say without Davis Bacon, you get uh, you know got four roads for the price of three. Right. Right. Sure. Um, Glenn in Virginia asks, we have become economic <laughs> illiterates, uh, where far left charlatans like Bernie Sanders and AOC capture the public's attention and yeah. set the agenda for so many Americans. Have the forces of freedom allowed the public agenda to be hijacked by the left, and how can we get it back? That's a great question. And, and number one, I was, I was thinking about this the other night. What we've done, remember I mentioned, government could reach 52% of GDP yeah. this year. Oh my goodness. I don't think in Bernie Sanders' wildest dreams he ever thought something like that yeah. could happen. So we're, right, right. we're to the left of where Bernie Sanders was yeah. right now. Yeah. So, now, then the question is, why is this happening? Why do we have economic illiterates? Why do we have people who can't even mention what, what the rights are in the First Amendment? I mean, yeah. why? And the answer is, you all know the answer. We're paying a high price for the last 30 to 40 years, allowing the left to take over the government schools. Yeah. And they are indoctrinating kids from the second grade, for, if not in kindergarten, with these left-wing yeah. ideas. And they're not learning about the Constitution. They're not learning about American history. They're, uh, they're learning about climate change. They're learning about racism but they're not learning about the greatness of our country and the rights. And I was very disturbed by, I was looking at some polling on the shutdown. And uh, one of the groups that is the most in favor of the shutdown is millennials. Ah. Millennials, and that, it's very heartbreaking, isn't yeah. it? And, yeah. and I was looking at the poll, millennials, uh, they have a higher, uh, they value safety and security over freedom. And that is the road to tyranny. They yeah. don't, you know, think about this, millions of Americans, we just celebrated Memorial Day, the millions of mm -hmm. Americans who've given their life to protect our freedoms. And this, this generation does not, uh, not all of them, of course, but I'm just sure. saying that the millennials, and so the, if, folks, if you want to reform in the system and you want to fix that problem, 
we have to do something about the government schools because they are indoctrinating, they're not teaching. Yeah. What's the old saying, you know, that uh, they, uh, you know, what schools are supposed to teach people how to think, and now yeah. what they do is teach people what, what to, to think. think. Yeah. Duncan in Colorado says, what do you see as being the biggest hurdle of cleaning up the swamp? You've been here in D.C. for a long time. We've tried to do these things. Reagan tried to do it. Uh, uh, well, the Bushes allegedly tried to do it at some point, but here we are. Any suggestions about how we do this? Well, term limits would be good. You know, yeah. uh, I've always been a big advocate of term limits. Um, you know, the, I don't know. I, I can't even, given what we've done just in the last month or two, I mean, we, we just elected a president whose most famous, you know, line before the election was drain the swamp. And Americans around the country get it, of how, how devious uh, and, uh, and destructive big government can be, and yet now here we are with the biggest government ever. We just have to keep talking about draining the swamp. We have to keep educating people that when you send your money to Washington, you're only getting 80 cents on the dollar back. So why would you want to do that? Yeah. And get rid of the high-powered, uh, you know, price people, the lobbyists and the lawyers. And uh, three out of the five wealthiest counties, even today, are here in Washington D.C. Yeah, that's scary. Shane in New Hampshire says, "Do you believe that this crisis? This is a great question. Will give big labor an advantage or disadvantage going into the 2020 congressional election?" This goes to your point about the separation between private sector workers and yeah. public sector workers. And any thoughts on that? I look. I'm not. I'm not as pessimistic as most people are about the the election. Uh, look, if it had not been for coronavirus, Trump was on stage for um, for winning. Uh, sorry about that. That's okay. On, on stage for winning a 40-state uh, re-election landslide. Mm -hmm. I, mean, there was a, I mean, we had the best economy in 35 years. Now it's going to be a dogfight, no question about it. But ultimately, the reason that Democrats are going to lose is very simple, because the Democratic Party today has become the party of lockdown. They have, they have tethered themselves to that line, locked down the economy. Three or four months from now, people aren't going to be talking about coronavirus. They're going to talk about jobs. They're going to talk about, you know, uh, how do we make businesses grow, get investment. Trump has the formula for that. Biden's against it. Yeah. Uh, William W. in Ohio says, this is a great question for you, Steve. I'm interested to hear your answer. Considering all the money being made out of nothing, what prediction <laughs> do you have for inflation in the next few years and its effect on pay? Now, that may be a short-term yeah. question, a long-term question. You want to address that one? Well, we have deflation now, believe it or not. So okay. flat prices are falling right now. Uh, consumer prices fell in the last two months. Uh, you know, when you've got a 30-year bond at 1.3% interest rate, there's not a lot of inflation fear out there. But I do think there's got to be some um, uh, day of reckoning, right? You know, mm -hmm. you can't just keep borrowing and printing money and thinking that somehow, you know, that it's free. I, I do think prices are going to rise as we come out of this, and that's going to be a second challenge. So I think it's a great question. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Matt in Florida, to what extent has the Janus decision impacted big labor's political activity? Janus, uh, as no. you might know, you probably know, Steve, was our case litigating on behalf of an Illinois employee that freed every government worker in the country from being forced to pay dues or fees to work for their government. Well, I'm going to let you answer that. Yeah, well. You, you know about 10 times yeah. more money about you. Well, we think it's going to make a big difference. Yeah. We know that uh, every government, where no government worker can, can be compelled to pay fees in order to keep their jobs with government. We know that immediately upon the Supreme Court ruling uh, back on June 27th of 2018, that literally uh, a f uh, $500 million of union revenue just disappeared. Uh, we've been litigating. We have probably another 30 or 40 cases litigating. We're we actually just filed a brief with the U.S. Supreme Court to get Mark Janus his money back. You know, one of the things about constitutional law, Steve, is interesting. And this case goes all the way back to 1886, um, a case that, uh, that says, you know, if something is deemed to be unconstitutional, it's as if it never occurred, as if it never happened, and there is no protection, there's no nothing for it. So what we're arguing is, let's go back and get the money that was taken unconstitutionally from these people, and obviously that's a huge, that's literally billions of dollars from organized labor. They're obviously fighting it. They're putting up this good, this uh, you know, good defense. We have a basic for uh, reasonable defense on this, good faith defense. Um, we're trying to break that down. We'll be in the, we'll, the Supreme Court looks like they may conference our case on June 11th. Um, look, if we can let public sector workers and, and if we can let them choose whether or not to support labor unions, it'll hold union officials more accountable. That means they get out of politics per se, unless they spend money that's specifically given by people that give it on purpose. Um, and give it with authorization to play in politics. And if we can get, I mean, the unions, because they can collect the money from private sector workers still in 23 states, they, they're not accountable. They can spend this money on yeah. politics, and they do. They're one of the biggest spenders in politics that we know of. So and it's always um, been a big problem. Yeah. We got one more question, and we're going to let Steve go. Uh, Peter in Massachusetts says, why don't Republicans take action to make the Democrats' unions illegal in the public sector in local, state, federal employment? They don't have the votes in Congress, but could use federal courts up to the Supreme Court, right? 
You want me to take that one? Yeah, well, I'll just say <laughs> Go ahead. I agree with you, but I do want your response to it. Yeah. It's something that when I was at the Wall Street Journal, we wrote a lot about. You did. And I think it was, it wasn't it FDR who was, yeah. who was opposed to public sector unions. It's unthinkable we would unionize the government. Yeah. You know, and the Executive Council and George Meany at the AFL-CIO said the same thing. You know, you just can't. It's not the same as the private sector. This notion that we've created a public sector labor law that mirrors kind of the confrontational adversarial model that we have in the private sector where you're you're the you're the CEO, you know what the bottom line is, I'm the union guy, says we need a ten dollar raise an hour. And you say, Mark, we can't do that. And there are substitute goods there. So we're going on a strike. Widget company B, more incorporated over here is making exactly what you make. They pick up market share, you lose revenue, you go out of business. In the public sector, that model does not work. Yeah, because the way by we like to put it was, you know, it's like um, you know so the the unions elect the public officials, right. yeah. then they sit across the table from them and sure. negotiate. And that's part of the problem because there's nobody at the negotiating table. How did Illinois' pension system get so inflated and right. so ridiculous where you have people making $125,000 a year, you know, more money on their pensions practically than they... It's because the, the politicians uh, were representing the unions, not the taxpayers. But here's the other problem. What happened with all these pensions is even good governors, they're like, okay, I'm going to be gone in four years. I don't sure. care what's going to happen in you know, 15, 20 years. So give them what they want, buy peace with the unions, and that's what happened. And now the day of reckoning is here, and that's why public sector unionism is bad. Before we go, I want to mention one last thing. Sure. I forgot. I should have said this at the outset. So we are... Um we are now, I uh, have a, a newsletter we put out every morning. You're getting at the prospect. I am. Yeah, and issue number 38 this morning. Yeah, actually. right. Yeah. And so we, uh, I want to just, anybody wants it, it's, you're going to love the price of this. You know how much it costs? Zero. I think it's, it's zero, right? I, have I just, haven't paid for anything. You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All you have to do is, uh, if you want to get it, just go to Committee on Unleashed Prosperity uh, website and just sign up. And what we're giving people is the real yes. non-phony news about what's happened. The lies that have been told to the American people about COVID, about what the states are doing. Um, and, and there's been no apologies. There's been no setting the record straight. What the Washington Post and New York Times and CNN and MSNBC are saying um, has been so outrageously and possibly purposely, purposefully yeah. false. So, you know, people love this little newsletter because all we're doing is giving people, and you can read it in five minutes, just for like yeah. five or six bullet points, but it does tell you the real research, and I would really, uh, yeah. really um, encourage people to get yeah. that. It's called the Committee to Unleash Poverty. Uh, <laughs> prosperity. No, no, we, we've already unleashed poverty. Yeah. We're unleashing we did that prosperity. Already. Yeah, CTUP. <laughs> and uh, edition number 38 came out today, and I've been doing radio interviews with hosts across the country, and I've been using Steve's data that comes out in this little, this really quick little sheet comes out about 9 o'clock every morning. Yeah, and John Fund. Uh, yep, many John Fund is John. on board. He's yep. the, uh, he's Steve the editor Forbes of that. is involved. Uh, yep, you got it. Folks that have been strong. Steve, thank you thank for you. being here. Really I know you're great. Your, your, I love what you guys do. Valuable. Thank you all for supporting the American worker and fairness in the workplace uh, because uh, – it is one of the most important movements in America today, and we've been fighting this fight for a long time. When was and when was uh, uh, right to work? Committee, uh, 1955, Foundation, 1965. 1968. So yeah. 75 some years. You so. do the math. I can't do You're the, the economist. Yeah. 45, yeah. 60, you know, almost 70 years. So it's amazing, and thank you. And you couldn't do it without your. And this is a tough time. I know. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, I, I raise money for my little thing, and it's tough to raise money now because everybody's feeling a lot financially strained. But now more than ever, your contributions really really can make a difference in winning these uh, important fights that are going to uh, have an impact on our future generations. That's what I'm so nervous about is this massive borrowing, six trillion this year alone, folks, six trillion dollars, not six billion, six trillion. Who, does, who do these politicians think that's going to pay for that? It's going to be your children and your grandchildren and your grandchildren's children. Or That's a child abuse, folks. We can't allow it to happen. Yeah. Steve, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you all for tuning in from uh, here at the Right to Work headquarters of the Norma Zimdahl studio. It's been a pleasure to bring this. This is kind of our first attempt at this, and I've never hosted a talk show before. But uh, <laughs> The new Steve, Oprah Winfrey, Steve folks. Steve carried the, the weight. New Oprah Steve Winfrey. carried the weight. <laughs> Thank you all, and, uh, and look up Steve Moore and, and his uh, committee to unleash prosperity. Thanks, Steve. Appreciate it. Okay. Fist pump. Thank you, Mark. Okay.